Good evening. Welcome to this edition of the De La Pietra Lecture Series. Our speaker this evening is Etienne Gis. He's a French mathematician. He comes to us from Lyon in France. He was educated at the uh, University of Lille in France, got his uh, degree in 1979, He's had positions at Lille, at the uh, City University of New York, position at uh, IMPA, the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics in Rio de Janeiro, which is not a bad gig if you can get it, and then went in 1988 to uh, the École Normale Supérieure in Lyon, where he is a director of research uh, from there until today. He is well known for his work in geometry, in topology, and in dynamics, and in the intersection of these three fields. He's the union. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a wiseacre. He's the author of over 70 articles on these uh, disciplines. He's been an invited speaker at the, each of the last three international congresses. And he has received many prizes for his work in geometry, topology, dynamics, and their union. <laughs> and is, he is a member of the French uh, Academy of Sciences. He's also well known for his ability to explain clearly and vividly concepts from geometry, dynamics, and topology uh, to general audiences like this one. Uh, he's also well known for his mathematical movies, including Dimension, a, tour, a mathematical tour, and Chaos, a mathematical adventure both of which are available, I believe, on YouTube. Is that correct? So if you're interested, you can watch these movies. And as I said, he's well known to be a very good expositor of geometry, topology, and dynamics. And we are very, very pleased to have him here this evening. And his title, as you can see, is The Story of Flat Surfaces. Etienne. Thank you, John. So I want to begin my story a long time ago with Euler. We all like Euler. Euler was asking a very, very simple question. Which surfaces can be covered with paper? That's a very simple question. Of course, you have to make it clear mathematically. For example, if you take a sphere, can you cover it with paper? Yes, I mean, you can, of course, wrap a sphere in paper, but you will produce wrinkles, you will produce, you have to deform the paper, so this is not the right question. The right question is, can you cover the surface allowing bending, but no stretching? Euler wrote a wonderful paper that I want to describe at the beginning of this talk. Uh, uh, which is some kind of description of all surfaces that you can cover with paper. Of course, cylinders are a possibility. If you have a cylindrical post, uh, you, can, you can just post a poster on it without bending, with, with bending, but with no stretching. Another example is, of course, a cone. You can easily construct a conical hat with paper, for example, with no wrinkle and uh, with no deformation. But the question of Euler is, are there more surfaces that you can cover with paper, more than cylinders and cones? Already, cones and cylinders are beautiful enough, and you can do beautiful things, and you can cover beautiful bodies with them. But here's the paper of Euler, 1770. It's in Latin, but it is such 
easy Latin that we can understand it. De solidis corum superficiem in planum explicare licet. Can you translate that? <laughs> so, this is the solids whose boundary can be explicit, can, can be developed on the plane. So this is very, very interesting from many points of views. First of all, at the time, even the great Euler could not think of a surface as something abstract. For him, a surface was the boundary of something. Just like today in, in primary schools, kids have difficulty making the difference between the ball and the sphere. For many kids, the ball is nothing more than the bound, the, the sphere is nothing more than the boundary of the ball. It's a conceptual difficulty to understand a surface abstractly. And Euler was like that. For him, all surfaces, by definition, were boundary of some three-dimensional object. The second point I like is explicare. You know, uh, in, in French and maybe also, uh, to explain. To explain, what does that mean in English? To unfold. So to unfold the surface on the plane is to explain the surface, is to develop it. So the question of Euler is, which, surf, which, which three-dimensional three bodies can be developed on the plane in, 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 without creating uh, 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 wrinkles? So let's continue. Octore Euler. Notissima est proprietas cylindri et coni. It is well known and easy to prove. This is Gromov style. Huh? <laughs> it is well known and easy to prove that the cylinder and the cone can be explained on the plane. And the question is, can we understand all surfaces that you can develop on the plane? And he says somewhere uh, that the sphere is not like that. Uh, look, cum eio superficies nullo modo in plano. Some surfaces in no way can be explained on the plane. And so the question is, can we get a complete classification of those surfaces that can, be, that can be made flat? And then he has a theorem. First, I give a definition, a contemporary definition. One says that the surface is developable if you can cover it with paper, allowing bending, but with no stretching. And the theorem of Euler, first theorem, is if a surface is developable, then it has to be ruled. And a surface is ruled if it is filled by lines, straight lines, contained in it. So you have a family of lines moving in space. This family of lines will, de will describe a surface that by definition is called a ruled surface. And the theorem of Euler is that every developable surface has to be ruled. For example, the sphere is not ruled and then cannot be developed. But of course, this is only a necessary condition. For example, if you take this hyperboloid, which is obviously ruled and actually ruled in two ways, it is intuitively clear that if you try to put a, sh a, 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 a leaf of paper on it, it will not match. So this is obviously ruled, but not developable. And so the main theorem of Euler is that it describes very precisely among those ruled surfaces, those which are developable. And the theorem is this. You take a curve in three space, a curve. And for each point on that curve, you take its tangent. And you look at the motion of this tangent along the curve. This will describe a surface, a specific ruled surface, made out of the tangents to a curve. 
And the theorem of Euler is that the only developable surfaces are cylinders, cones, and the family of tangents to some curve in space. This is just fantastic. Uh, you, know, um, you know, many mathematicians in this room, I can bet that not 10% of them can prove that now. This, you know, this is one thing which is really fantastic with mathematics. You have theorems of 1770 which are still relevant and still hard to understand. And this is a non-trivial theorem. Uh, uh, well, most theorems of Euler are non-trivial. So here's a picture. I took an helix, and I took the family of tangents to the helix. You see, uh, this produces these yellow lines. And the family of these yellow lines is describing a surface. But you can see this surface is interesting because it has a blue side and a green side, or black side, as you wish. And you see that this surface is somehow singular along the curve you started with. And this, Euler understood it very perfectly. This is called a striction line. Okay, This is the family. You see, so uh, if you cut this surface, you see a cusp. So this is Euler. Some artists are very fascinated by developable surfaces. Here's another one. Maybe the Simon Center could buy one because uh, uh, this is a. Uh, maybe this is expensive, I think. <laughs> now, let me go to the second mathematician of the time, Monge, Gaspard Monge. Gaspard Monge is one of my favorite mathematicians. Uh, he was a mathematician. And then the French Revolution began. And he felt, as a mathematician, to be useless for his country. So he stopped doing mathematics. And he began be being useful for his country. Like, for example, opening a school for uh, teaching how to build cannons. And uh, 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 this is very interesting, because this school called uh, uh, called the canon. This school was a model for the, for, for the Ecole Polytechnique and the Ecole Normale Supérieure in which I'm now teaching. So Monge was a fantastic mathematician. And he had another point of view on the theory of uh, developable surfaces. He proved the following theorem. A developable surface is just the same thing as an envelope of planes. So here's the picture. This is, I took this photograph myself. So you see, uh, this is a piece of glass. This is a plane. And this is another piece of glass. And another one. And another one. And the full family of planes is tangent to a surface. And this surface is developable. And it's obviously de developable, because you can put it on, on the plane, because it's made out of pieces of planes. And the theorem of, of Monge is that a surface is developable if and only if there is a family of planes moving in space which are tangent to the given surface. It's a, some kind of different point of view on the same object. Here's another developable surface. Why is it developable? Because it is obviously an envelope of planes. You see, this surface has been obtained by rolling on the table a curved wire. You take a wire, you put it on the table, it will roll on the table, and the surface it will describe is obviously developable. It's obviously an envelope of planes. This is the white surface. Now, the next hero of my story is Lebeg, Henri Lebeg. Henri Lebeg, in 1899, 
was a young student in Ecole Normale Supérieure, and he was attending the differential geometry class by the great mathematician Darboux. And Darboux was teaching the theorem of Euler and Monge. A developable surface is ruled. And the story is, and this is a true story, it's not gossip, the story is that Lebeg in the, in the classroom said, Professor Darboux, this is not true. And he gave a counterexample to the theorem of Euler. And this is famous counterexample. This is called the handkerchief counterexample. So uh, Darboux, uh, uh, Lebeg said, how can you claim that the developable surface is ruled if my handkerchief is not ruled? It used to be plain when my mother ironed it. But now, I see no line in it. So how is it possible? And so the trick, of course, is that this surface of the handkerchief is indeed developable, but is not smooth. It is a continuous surface, which has no tangent planes. And the good story is that Darboux was amazed by that. And he was clever enough to understand that Lebeg was creating a new field. He was creating the field of geometry with low regularity. He was creating the field of fractal sets. And in the next week, uh, Lebeg published a compte rendu note containing his counterexample that I will show to you now. The counterexample of Lebeg is very interesting, but I think a good way of understanding it is to push forward maybe 70 years and go to this great designer, Issei Miyake. Miyake is the king of pleated surfaces. And a pleated surface is something, I don't know if you have already seen, this kind of beautiful cloth. But they are locally fractal. They are flat. They are not ruled. They are the counterexamples of Lebeg. And uh, uh, um, I, I'm sure that uh, Issey Miyake knows nothing about mathematics. But the example of, of Lebeg I'm going to show you is exactly this one. So here's the mathematical example of Lebeg. But be, oh, not this one. So give me five minutes, just a pure pleasure. I will show you beautiful surfaces. My excuse is that I claim that this is counterexample to Euler theorem, but uh, it's only for pure pleasure. Look at these beautiful dresses by Miyake. They are developable, of course. They are somehow ruled because you can see some lines, straight lines. And then, flexible surfaces. So let's come back to Lebeg. Let me explain to you the compte rendu note of Lebeg one week after he discovered this idea. So here's a cone. This cone is, of course, developable, because you can make it out of paper. Now, let me fold it in the middle like that. 
So you see, it's a surface of revolution, and you rotate this piece of curve, which is continuous, but not smooth. So this is derivative minus 1, derivative plus 1, derivative minus 1. You rotate thus around the axis, and you get the, the dress that you have seen before. <coughs> this object is, of course, developable. Because if you project it to the cone along the vertical lines, it's an isometry. So this object is, of course, developable. And then you do it again an infinite number of times to produce this fractal curve whose derivative at almost every point is plus 1 or minus 1. And this fractal curve, when you let it rotate around the axis, produces something which is obviously developable. Because if you project it along the vertical line, it is an isometry. Therefore, you have this object which is completely fractal, and which contains no line. Completely counterexample to, to Euler. So this is the contribution of, of Lebesgue. Now let me go further with Nash. Nash, much later, in 1950-something, proved in 54 that you can do better than, uh, uh, than Lebesgue. And you can even produce examples of surfaces which are developable, which are smooth, and which are not ruled. So this means that this is a counterexample to Euler's theorem, except that you have one derivative, but you do not have two derivatives. It's uh, much more regular than the example of Lebesgue, but it is not enough regular to apply the proof of Euler. The proof of Euler requires two derivatives. This is only once, once derivative. Now, uh, uh, let me show you this example of, uh, of, of uh, Nash. Very recently, three colleagues of mine from Lyon and Grenoble decided to produce a picture of this Nash theorem, to produce a flat, smooth, object in three space and to look at it. And they did it, and they even produced a film. So I will show it to you. It's, they took the proof of, of Nash, and they made it computable. And they produced images of the image of, of, of Nash. So here's the, here's the object that Nash had in mind, and that my three colleagues, four colleagues, produced. So this is a flat surface, which is differentiable, which, do not, which does not have two derivatives. So it's, it's not fractal, because at each point there is a tangent plane. But it's a flat surface, which is C1. flat torus. Yes. So as you, as you know, it is obtained as a limit of a converging sequence of corrugation. And this is the sixth corrugation. It's hard computing. It took a long time of computation. Let me change gears. Let us change paper and let us use now cloth. What is the difference between paper and cloth? Cloth is made out of two families of threads. And when you put a cloth on your shoulder, for example, the threads are deformed, 
and the angle between the threads can be changed. So that's a different mathematical question. So let me tell you the story. This very serious person is Pafnuti Chebyshev, very beautiful first name. And uh, uh, let me tell you the story, the following story about him. In his collected papers, I have been knowing this for many years. In, this collected in the collected papers of Chebyshev, there is this short page explaining in French that uh, uh, Professor Chebyshev gave a talk in Paris in 1878 and that, uh, that was a very interesting talk. The title was Sur la coupe des vêtements, on cutting cloth. But unfortunately, the editors of the collected papers did not, they had no, they didn't want to publish the, 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 the talk because they didn't think the paper was finished. So they had the draft, but they didn't want to publish the draft. So I have been knowing that for many, many years, asking to myself what could be behind this, uh, this, the, 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 this draft. And very recently, I was reading a PhD thesis in the history of mathematics, and in the footnote, the author was writing that she had seen the draft. So I sent an email to her asking for the draft, and she said, I have seen it somewhere in Russia. Fortunately, I have a, 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 a very good a friend of mine, a very good student of mine, he's Russian, and he has many friends in Russia, and he started the uh, inquiry, and he wrote to many friends, and finally they found it. They found the manuscript in, the, in a box in the uh, uh, Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg. And I was so happy to find it. So here it is. This is handwritten. It's about 40 pages long. This is written in French, sur la coupe des habits. Uh, uh, almost perfect French, good old times. And uh, 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 this, is, uh, in, this is like a draft, really. You see uh, computations. And you know computations in the margin, and mistakes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, 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 so I read this. That's very interesting because this paper contains a lot of uh, 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 discoveries that were made after Chebyshev. For example, you find explicitly the sine Gordon equation, which is discussed. And uh, 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 of course, there are some mistakes in it, but not too many mistakes. So it's about 40 pages long. And I was delighted to, to read it. And uh, uh, I was even more delighted to improve the theorem. So let me explain what I did. Before I explain what it is, uh, a cloth, as you all know, is made out of two families of threads. Uh, so the vertical ones are called the warps, and the horizontal ones are called the weft. Did you know that? Yeah? <laughs> wow, I'm impressed. Okay? <laughs> Warp and weft. And uh, uh, what's, of course, what's happening if you take a cloth and when you deform it, you can expect that the little squares made by the threads are transformed into rhombuses because along the threads, you can assume that there is no deformation. But the angle between the threads can be changed. So it's a very interesting question. You have a, a piece of surface, like your shoulder. Is it possible to cover it with two families of threads in such a way that the threads form little rhombuses? This is a very precise mathematical question. And this is the topic of the paper of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Chebyshev. This is a beautiful hyperbolic PDE. And then he somehow solves it, mm, waving hands. And um, here's what he proves. 
he proves that it is possible to close half the sphere. So he claims that it's possible to cut a piece of cloth, to put it on the, on the, on the half sphere, and covering exactly one half of the sphere. So if you take two pieces like that, you, you can, uh, how do you say, sew them on, 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 the, on the middle, and you have a beautiful clothed ball. In this same box in St. Petersburg, we found the template. Here's the template. This has been made by the Chebyshev. So the idea is that you take this, you cut this in, in, in a piece of cloth, you deposit it on a sphere. Let's say this middle point goes to the North Pole. And according to Chebyshev, the boundary of this object goes to the equator. And if you take two copies of it, you get a beautiful clothed ball. Now here's my theorem. I was so happy to do it. Chebyshev can close a half ball, I can close a full ball. And I show it to you. Here's my theorem. This is a template with a very strange shape. Oops, sorry. It looks like a star bounded by these yellow curves, but it's a complicated star. And on this picture, I drew in blue some curves which will be mapped to the parallels on the sphere. So the midpoint will go to the North Pole. These blue circles will go to the parallels. And the red lines that you can see here go to the meridians from the north to the south. I did not draw the threads. The threads are just vertical lines and horizontal lines. And the theorem is that if you deposit this on a ball, the four corners go to the south pole. And this will cover exactly the two sphere and we close the two sphere. So here's the, not the picture, but here's the, the movie. So this is my template. The ball is coming. And I will wrap the ball in the template. Here's what it is. So Chebyshev was not courageous enough to go to the South Pole. He stopped at the equator. You can check that all these those are the threads. Those are the threads. And you can see these uh, four singular this is one, this is the pole, and you have four singular points here. And uh, along the seams, the threads arrive with some angle. We're going to discuss that later. Not to fishermen, but I was worrying. Maybe this is known to people selling oranges. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> but this is not the case. OK, OK, OK. I have a friend. He's not a mathematician. He's an artist. And I like to chat with him. And I told him this theorem. And he said to me, well, you are a theoretician. I'm not sure your theorem is true. I want to check it. So he said to himself, I'm going to construct a ball, and I will try to close it. But how do you construct a ball? Well, first reaction would be to, be to go to a shop and to buy a soccer ball. But what he did is I, I want, he wanted to construct a wooden ball, a big one. So he cut. You know, these kind of things, it's a hard work. You have to smooth it. Then to smooth it, it's really hard work. And then he decided to draw the threads on the ball. So he asked me to send him the coordinate of each intersection point. 
So he only accepted files in Excel. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I had to learn Excel. And then he produced, he had the idea of putting some metallic wires. And he produced, I think, a beautiful object just for f the fun of it. I mean, he, no, no financial condition. It's a hard work just for the fun of it. And uh, he's, uh, uh, he's Pierre. Pierre, he likes mathematics. He's not mathematicians. He just loves mathematics. And then, much more recently, I discovered that this idea of Chebyshev has uh, somehow a commercial impact. And uh, here's uh, something you can find on the internet, how you can do Chebyshev clothing in practice. So these are rhombuses printed on a 3D printer. And you can deform it as you want. You can deform it. And then you can ask yourself, can you use it for clothing? And indeed, I chose the most uh, politically correct uh, pictures. You can draw beautiful dresses by this uh, uh, procedure. So you can check that they are rhombuses. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and even going further, let me show you some, uh, I have no commercial connection with that. But let me, let me show how people can use this kind of idea to produce dresses in a very interesting way. This is called, this is a commercial website where you can buy a dress. And you can make the dress as you want. So here's the, 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 the advertisement for it. You will see. Though this is a flexible object. I'm sure Chebyshev would have loved that. What I like is that you can choose your dress on the net. With these buttons, you can choose, you can modify your, your necklace or whatever, and you can choose what you want. And this is not expensive. I mean, you have the price written, you know, $90, $82, $75. It's wonderful.
OK, let me switch to the next mathematician who was interested by clothing, Zeeman. Zeeman is very famous for his theory of catastrophe theory. And he was the expert on uh, uh, singularity theory, etc., etc., etc. And at some moment, he, among the aspects of catastrophe theory and singularity theory, you have to understand how a surface maps to another surface. And this kind of picture, of course, was familiar to Zeeman. And at some moment, believe it or not, Zeeman published a paper in a journal called Costume. Here's the paper. It's Mathematics Applied to Dressmaking, Costume, Volume, volume 28. And this is an incredible paper. So he has been to Bangkok. And he came back home with a piece of cloth. And he wanted to uh, uh, create a dress for his wife. He had no experience of that. And uh, he wrote a paper explaining how to do it. And uh, uh, let me show you some pages of this paper. Let me see. You know, this is um, topology, Euler characteristics, etc. Curve alpha, curve beta, etc., etc. It's incredible paper, totally useless, I think. But nevertheless, what I like is the, uh, at the end of the paper, there is a commentary by, by his wife, by Lady Zeeman. So Lady Zeeman says that uh, uh, the length of cloth brought back from Bangkok and declared by all to be insufficient for a dress was ivory colored Thai silk with two bands of delicate color, etc., etc. And what is interesting is that at the end it was, she said, unfortunately, the figure outgrew the dress in time. <laughs> it was given away. <laughs> anyway, so Zeeman also was interested by uh, uh, dressmaking. So Chebyshev, Zeeman, and uh, the next one, of course, as maybe many of you know, I believe, is Thurston. Thurston, at the end of his uh, life, and then he told me today that he believed that actually he was always thinking about this kind of question, was interested by the way of covering objects, like, for example, the human body, by pieces of paper. How can we tailor a dress, for example? And as Chebyshev and as Zeeman, he was interested. After all, geometry is the study of shapes. And uh, he was really interested by understanding all these questions. And as you probably know, Thurston had in his career the concept of pleated surfaces, which is very close to the actual pleated cloth. And here are some pictures of Thurston working at uh, uh, working at uh, trying to produce dresses. I don't know if he succeeded or not, but this is uh, Thurston trying to. This is Thurston with the artistic director of Miyake in 2010. And Thurston had the idea of using a theorem of Pogorelov and Alexandrov, again, I was discussing with Dennis if he knew it or not. And Dennis thinks that he knew it. This is a, a wonderful theorem, which is far from being obvious. You take two convex domains in the plane with the same perimeter. And you choose one point on the red one, one point on the, on the yellow one of the same length, same perimeter, I said. Same length. And you glue, you cut these two domains in the plane with scissors. And you glue the two boundaries using some kind of adhesive tape. And the theorem is that when you do that, you do produce a convex set in three space. So here's an example. If you take two ellipses and you glue, or let's say, identical ellipses, and you glue them on their the boundary, 
have, after having made a, a one fourth of a turn, you produce this kind of object. So the theorem of, of Pogorelov and Alexandrov says that you can construct objects in three space by gluing convex sets on their boundaries. And the theorem is even stronger. It says that you can not only glue convex sets, but you can also glue non-convex sets under the condition that two points which are glued should be such that the sum of the two curvatures on the left and on the right should be always positive. So there should be more con convexity here than concavity here. If you do that, you produce an object in three space, which will be a convex set. So it's a very beautiful theorem. If you want to construct a convex set in three space, one way of doing it is to glue two convex, two non-convex sets in the plane. And he did that. And here's the construction of, of, of Thurston and Delp. So this, this is the paper, and this is the theorem. You have here on this picture eight triangles. They do not look like triangles, but they have each one of them, they are all the same. Each one of them have three vertices. Here's one, two, three. And these three vertices are connected by edges, except that these edges are not straight lines. These edges are crooked lines. So you take this ed the, these eight triangles and you glue them as if you would like to construct an octahedron. An octahedron is made out of eight triangles. You take these eight strange triangles and you glue them just with the same combinatorics as if you would like to create an octahedron. And indeed, you get that. So you get something which, of course, is not a sphere. Because, the, for example, the blue part is a developable surface and therefore is not a sphere. So the blue part has zero curvature, has zero Gaussian curvature. The curvature of this object is concentrated on these lines, on the seams. So the curvature form, the curvature measure, is in this case concentrated on a one-dimensional skeleton of the, oct of the octahedron. It's a very beautiful way of constructing balls. And indeed, uh, you have in this paper of Thurston many examples, many pictures. I like them very much. Many attempts. And I want to finish by showing that this idea of Thurston has been used. I don't know if, if engineers were aware of that or not. But this is exactly the idea that has been used for the, the soccer ball in the last World Cup. So this is the official bazooka, the official uh, uh, soccer ball for the, for the game in Brazil. And if you look carefully, and you will see that in a moment, this ball is actually a cube. It's made out of six squares. And I'll show you the squares. So you combine six squares to construct a cube, except that the squares, of course, they have four corners, but the edges are not straight lines. So you construct these strange squares with four vertices, as every square, but connected by uh, 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 curved segments. And if you glue them as if you would like to construct a cube, you produce the bazooka. So here's the template if you want to do that yourself at home. I did it myself. It's a great pleasure. So you cut these squares. Here's one square, for example. One vertex here in black. Another vertex here in black. Third vertex and fourth vertex. 
and this vertex and this vertex are connected by this curve. You glue that and you get the bazooka. And when you want to build a bazooka, you see here this point is a corner of the cube where three squares meet. So it's very, first of all, it's very beautiful. And second of all, it uses only six panels instead of 32 for the standard uh, soccer ball. So, uh, uh, what time is it? Yeah. OK, so, so I want to, to spend maybe two or three minutes showing that what I showed to the kids this morning, the actual making of this ball. And then my, my talk will be finished. Here's the actual construction of the bazooka. This is not leather, this is, uh, how do you say that in English? Polyurethane? Poly polyurethane. Does that clarify something? The soccer balls have been in leather until 84. <laughs> so let me make some additional comment. When I said that this ball is a cube, this is not quite true. Because the symmetry group of the cube contains orientation reversing isometries. The symmetry group of this ball does not contain orientation reversing because it some, has some, some orientation on the, face, on, on the faces. So this may explain some kind of a spin, possible spin for the, for the ball. It might be rotating better in one way than in the other way. So that may be a drawback for, for, drawback for, this, for this ball. OK, so I'm finished. I just wanted to finish by, let's say, uh, dedicating this talk to William Thurston. Thank you very much. Questions? Here with your new shape. Uh, this seems to be like something that a cartographer would be interested in. Have you tried making a... Yes and no, because of course the, the, 
nobody cares about my, my clothing of the sphere because it's not conformal. It's not an isometry. It's it's nothing. It's only it's only preserving the length in two directions. And as far as I know, on our planet there is no weft and rough and wrapped. There's a, you know there is there is no reason to use it. No, not to use it. It's probably beautiful. <laughs> yes. Well, it's I I'm not sure it will be beautiful because close to the seams it will be a tragedy for the countries there. <laughs> That's what it is. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe if you put that in the middle of the ocean, I don't know. Yes? So following that question, for your clothing the sphere, you mentioned the four singular points. Yes. Do you, do you lose connectivity? And the reason I asked the question is for use of it for a computational domain. Connectivity of what? The, the vertices, is it, does it maintain, say it's logically Cartesian to begin, does it maintain that? I'm sorry, I don't understand. The, maybe somebody can explain the question to me. I'm not sure I understand it. But when points come together, yes. say you have four corners, Yes. does that stay all the way or do you lose that at your singular points? You know, I have to have singular points anyway. By the, uh, you know, the, uh, by algebraic topology, it is not possible to have two foliations on the sphere. So singular points are there, and they have to exist, and I cannot do anything against that. Maybe you could ask, could you get a clothing with less singular points? Maybe. This I don't know. Uh, a similar, let me give you another question from my artistic friend. So my friend was happy when he built this ball and he did this beautiful uh, metallic wires and he told me, can you clothe an ellipsoid? <coughs> and I was shocked by this question because I had not thought about it. And then I, I did think about it. I thought rather hard and I could prove a theorem. And the theorem that I can prove is that if a convex set, a convex object, is close enough to a sphere, then I can clothe it using some kind of implicit function theorem. So I was happy, and I went to my friend, and I said, well, I can prove that if epsilon is small enough, I can clothe it. And he said, what is epsilon? I said, small enough. <laughs> and he was uh, making fun of me. <laughs> so still today, I do not know if it's possible to clothe an egg. So uh, this is a fundamental question. No? <laughs> yes. What is the connection with sine Gordon? Yes, the connection with sine Gordon is this: that when when. Um, uh, when you want, you have this, um, these two foliations, and they have an angle. At every point, there's an angle, depending on the two coordinates on the foliations, x and y. And when you compute the curvature of the surface as a function of the angle, you get precisely the sine Gordon equation. So the angle satisfied. The angle satisfies the sine Gordon equation. If and only the curvature is plus one, I mean, OK, let me put it this way. You take two foliations like that, and you impose some angle at each point, omega of x, y. And you ask yourself, under which condition of on omega of x, y do I produce a, a, a surface with curvature plus one? And the answer is, if and only if sine Gordon. And if the curvature varies, you, you get another equation. There was a question here, yeah. yeah. Can you explain how your shape was flat, the shape that you generated with your colleagues on the computer that was in two and the scale of How is that flat? Which one? The one that you said your colleagues generated and the computer generated. Nash. Nash. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it is okay, okay. So I, I'm not the best expert to explain that. But the idea is that 
You start with a map from a domain in the plane to the sphere, which is not preserving length, but which is what? It's my original mathematician. Yeah, so which is not as you want. <laughs> and you want to improve it. So uh, what uh, Nash did, and then later Gromov and Kuiper, they explain how to improve it to produce a map which is better. And this improvement produces the, these waves. And then once you have done that, you want to improve it again. And you produce another series of waves in some other direction. And you do it again and again and again. And the theorem of Nash, Kuiper, Gromov is that at the limit, you get what you wanted. And each step is a high complicated computation. So it is, oh, it is developable. It is covered. In, in this talk, you can understand the word flat as synonymous as developable. You can cover with paper. Actually, this object that you saw, uh, this uh, three-dimensional uh, flat C1, uh, this, this object that we mentioned, has been printed in 3D, big like that. I have a copy. I could have, you know, I, I couldn't carry it in my luggage, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a beautiful object. You can, you can feel that this is smooth. This, what you really, you understand what smooth means <laughs> by your hand. Your hand understands what C1 is. <laughs> I guarantee, this is true. <laughs> and if you take a paper, you put paper on it, it's okay. The paper does not produce wrinkles, does not uh, produce any disaster. Uh, if you put paper on a sphere, you see disasters. But if you put the paper on this object, you see it fits pretty well. So this is what I mean by flat. Flat means accept the paper. Yes? Uh, uh, in this slide, pictures you were showing about making a soccer ball out of six panels, obviously you don't get a perfect square. Uh, no. But you get something very close yep. to this. Yep. Is it possible to compute what's the optimal shape of these panels to get as close to the sphere as possible? You're asking a wonderful question. I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, we were discussing that at lunch. This is, uh, this, is, uh, this is a very beautiful mathematical question. Can you optimize in some way the curve to make the, the object as round as possible? I have no idea. I just have to admit that the curve, I mean, even though Thurston was a great mathematician, the curve chosen by the soccer ball makers is much nicer than the curve of Thurston. The curve of Thurston is very complicated, and the curve of uh, these engineers is very simple. It's closer to round. Uh, I don't know. I know that the, the I, I don't know for the Thurston's ball, but what I know is that uh, for the uh, for the soccer ball, the soccer ball deviates from a sphere by one millimeter. At most one millimeter, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If, if, if the soccer ball was made of paper? Yeah, because, I mean, the Aha. materials are less. That's true. Well, I, I did myself a ball with paper, but I was, you know, I, you know I, I'm a mathematician, and I'm not very good for, with my hands. So uh, uh, my ball was not really round. <laughs> it was homeomorphic to a ball. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, so this um, the envelope of undeniable curve that is a, um, um, the uh, surface of rotation obtained from a fractal curve. Yeah, yeah. The integrated fractal curve to get you take it, you know, so that the fractal curve is the derivative of some other curve that will become developable. Mm, you integrate what? I mean, you have a fractal curve. Yeah. So this, the, so this fractal curve is any curve with the property that derivative is almost everywhere, plus one or minus one. So you, 
you make a, now a line yep. whose derivative is your fractal curve. So you integrate it, yeah? Right. Yeah. Yep. So does the rotation surface become uh, developed? No reason. I don't believe that. Is there any number of, any finite number of integrations that you can perform that it will become? I don't believe that. But you know, sometimes I s I'm not wrong. I'm wrong. I don't, I don't know. I, I see no reason to believe it. Let's thank Etienne again for a beautiful talk. Thank <clears throat> you.